Gary Glass joins me this week to discuss Homebrew Con and the American Homebrewers Association. This is Beersmith Podcast number 193. This is Beersmith Podcast number 193, and it's late May 2019. Gary Glass joins me this week to discuss the upcoming Homebrew Con, as well as the American Homebrewers Association and state of the homebrewing industry. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the Riptide Pump from Blickman Engineering. Designed for homebrewers, this pump features whisper quiet sealed housing, a removable triclamp stainless steel head that's easy to clean, and a built-in relief valve for easy priming. It also has the integral Blickman linear valve for precise flow control. Get the Riptide Pump today, another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith 3 is available now for download and also the mobile version's out. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider's recipe support to the Beersmith platform, along with new integrated water profile and mash pH tools. Dozens of new features include cloud folders, updated databases, support for fruit juice and honey, as well as new Whirlpool hop options. Download your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com and give it a try. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Gary Glass. He's director of the Home- American Homebrewer Association. Uh, he's here today to talk about the AHA, the state of homebrewing, and the upcoming Homebrew Con, which is scheduled for June 27th to 29th in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, Gary heads up the now, I, he tells me, 45,000 member American Homebrewers Association and is also active in the Brewers Association. Gary, it's great to have you back on the show. Oh, great to be with you, Brad. So it's been, uh, gosh, it's been a couple of years actually since I had you on last. Uh, I think it was way back when we were doing Baltimore, which was uh, at least two years ago, maybe three well, years was, ago now. That was, yeah, three years ago. Right? Three years well, ago. So um, what have you been up to the last three years, Gary? Oh, you know, mostly the same stuff. Uh, you know, I dedicating my life to homebrewing, uh, which is a good thing. So, uh, you know. There's well, worse things to do with your time. I, I know, and I'm, I'm fully aware that most people have worse things to do with their time. But, uh, you know, it's a labor of love for me. I'm, I've been a homebrewer for tw- over 20 years. Um, and, and to be able to, you know, spend, spend my work life uh, dedicated to supporting uh, the, the hobby I love and, and the, the homebrewing community, I really couldn't ask for more. And you mentioned uh, the homebrew homebrewing association continues to grow a little bit. It's at up to what 40, 45,000, I think you mentioned. Right, yeah, we're right around forty five thousand members right now. Um, we've been about that level for for the past few years, uh, but uh, you know, still seeing seeing a, a strong homebrewing community out there. So things are good. Awesome. Are you working at all uh, with organizations outside the U.S. too? That was just a question I had. Uh, yeah, we've uh, we've been working with uh, some homebrewers associations in Latin America, uh, as well as working with um, uh, some some homebrew uh, homebrew organizations in Europe. Our uh, our current um, Symergy editor, Dave uh, Dave Carpenter, has been in Berlin for the past two years. Uh, working remotely, and that's given him an opportunity to to, to visit a few different uh, countries and give presentations to uh, to their homebrewing uh, organizations. Awesome, yeah, I, I have uh, quite a quite a few of the people that use Beersmith now are overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, well, this year uh, you you wanted to start, I think, by talking a little bit about Homebrew Con, uh, which is coming up in Providence, Rhode Island, this year in end of June. Right. Um, yeah. What are some of the highlights for this year's, which I think is uh, 41st, if I got it right? That's right. Uh, 41st, uh, going to be June 27th through the 29th in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, our first time in, in Providence and our first time in New England in 28 years. So, uh, you know, it's great to be be going back to, to New England. 
Um, some of the things that are that I think are special about this, besides being in New England, which is you know a great area for for craft beer and for homebrewing, um, we have uh, we're doing three um, optional uh, three hour workshops, which is mm-hmm. something we 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 started last year uh, with, with Pat Fahey and Cicerone, and so in addition to that one, where we've also got uh, a workshop with John Palmer on water. And then uh, uh, Michael Tonsmeyer is doing uh, a workshop on sour beer. So um, an opportunity to get uh, a little bit more hands-on and, and really in-depth, whereas the other educational sessions are, are, are one hour long. Um, so those so are like uh, all-day sessions or something? And when are those? They're, they're three hours, and they're, uh-huh. they, those are taking place on, uh, on Thursday morning. So before we get, we really launch into the, to the rest of the conference. Uh, so that's the, that's on June 27th. And that's something that you can add on to a registration. Nice. And, uh, other highlights, uh, are you still doing the industry, uh, track? That's right. Yeah. We're still doing the industry track, which is kind of dedicated to homebrew supply shop owners and the, and the suppliers that supply them. Uh, it's a way that the AHA can, can support the, the businesses that support our hobby. Um, so we, we look forward to that. And, and it's also a great way to bring in uh, some of the shop owners who might not otherwise attend HomebrewCon and, and get them interacting with, the, with our members. Uh, we also have uh, uh, over 70 exhibitors at the, the conference this year, which is just that trade show is astounding. Nice. Uh, uh, I yeah, I remember got- when it all fit in like one little tiny room. <laughs> right. Yeah, we used to it basically was in a closet. Yeah. when I first started so, uh, having, having more than three or four exhibitors, uh, was, was a big deal back in the day. And so, uh, you know, to have, have HomebrewCon bring in 70 plus exhibitors is just mind blowing. Like seeing, seeing our, our trade show in, in a hundred square feet, a hundred thousand square feet space is, it's kind of mind blowing. So what's the, uh, what's the target audience for homebrew con for folks that are uh, maybe on the fence or haven't been before? Uh, well, it's definitely dedicated to, to homebrewers. Um, you know, all the, all the talks are about, you know, helping you make better beer, uh, learning more about, uh, uh, about the brewing process and, you know, history of beer. And, uh, there's just a huge range of, of topics that are covered in, in that area. Um, it is limited to members of the American Home Brewers Association, um, but anybody who's not a current member can can join via the registration process. Um, so, yeah, but it's it's something that we we do every year and and look forward to uh, uh, providing that uh, education and um, and and fun. There's a obviously there's a whole lot it's, of homebrew that's being served. We, I mean, it's, thousands it's my of favorite homebrew. It's my favorite event of the year. I go to go to quite a few of these things, but it's it's usually my favorite. Yeah, there's there's nothing else like it. I mean, when no. we have uh, you know, we'll have over two thousand attendees this year, um, and you know it's it's the world's largest gathering of homebrewers. Yep. So just just having that 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 space where where homebrewers can get together is. Yeah, may, it makes for a fun event, but then you add in all the educational aspects and the the craft breweries that are that are going to be there. Um, it's yeah, there's there's nothing else like it. Well, a conference kicks off on Thursday, the twenty seventh of June, uh, in Providence. Um, actually, I didn't even ask you where's the venue. What's the venue this year? Uh, it's at the uh, Rhode Island Convention Center, which is right downtown Providence. Um, so like uh, last year, for example, we were in Port- Portland and their convention center is a little outside of downtown. This year we're right in the middle of downtown and Providence is a fairly small city, even though it's only 40 minutes away from Boston. Um, so it's really easy to navigate the downtown area, tons of great restaurants and lots of beer venues. Uh, there's a brew pub across the street from the convention center. So I, th- I think we, I don't think we've ever been at any closer to a brewery than we, we will be at this year's conference. Nice. Um, well, as I mentioned, it kicks off on Thursday. Who's the keynote speaker this year? Uh, this year we've got Dan Cleveland uh, from Maine Beer Company. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're definitely one of the one of the fastest growing breweries in in the New England states. Um, they've got a really cool story. Uh, they started out as one of the one of the first nano breweries um, started by by Dan and his brother David. Uh, they were home brewers before they started, as as is common with with breweries. But they've really grown it into a a, a quite a large brewery. But um, they have a their their theme, their business theme is do what's right. 
And so a lot of what they do is about being involved in their community. Um, they participate in in one percent for the environment, so they're they're donating uh, a one percent of their their proceeds to uh, environmental causes. Um, Dan's also very active in the craft brewing community as well as in, in politics, but he's currently the vice chair of the Brewers Association, mm. uh, as well as past president of the Maine Beer, Brewers Guild. Um, super nice guy. Uh, it's been I've had the opportunity to get to know him through his role on the BA board over the last few years and and really excited to have him as our as our keynote speaker. I, th I think he's going to really impress the audience. And then uh, all three days, you're going to be running seminars on virtually every aspect of beer brewing. And I think they're roughly an hour each. Um, what are some of the highlights of the seminars this year and speakers? Oh, gosh. We, we do have 68 different educational sessions. And like just looking through the list. Um, it's hard to pick favorites. Uh, well, of course, you are going to be presenting uh, <laughs> yeah. along with Jamil Zanishev and John Palmer. I'm just, yeah, uh, we're and, doing a little panel. It's, uh, I think it's a Q&A panel, right? Right, yeah. right. But, but what a great opportunity to, to be able to uh, get questions asked by experts by, like yourself. Um, but some of my, I mean, it's also a really great mix this year of, of home brewers and professional brewers. Um, we've got some historians um, Ron Pattison from the UK. Like, oh yeah. I've had Ron on the show several times. Yeah. Re renowned beer historian is going to be, uh, doing some myth busting on Scottish beers. Uh, we've got Teresa McCullough, who is the, uh, the Smithsonian's beer historian. Um, and then, you know, crowd favorites here. We got Denny and Denny Khan and Drew Beecham. Um, you know, excited to have Michael Fairbrothers. He'll be, he's, He's a, a common presenter at Homebrew. And Michael, be... uh, Michael, of course, runs uh, Moonlight Meadery, That's and right. uh, he's been on the show as well. But um, uh, I should mention, you do have several sessions on mead, right? That's right. We, I think we've got, I want to say there's five separate se sessions uh, dedicated to mead, um, and then additional sessions on cider, and uh, uh, we've got... Uh, kombucha and other uh, fermentation products we've got uh, something on a presentation on kimchi um nice uh we've got stan hieronymus is is a is another frequent uh, presenter at, at um humbrew Khan. he's going to be uh, talking kind of some of the latest in uh in hop science uh along with some some hop history uh you know, we got a presentation on diastaticus, which is something I'm interested in. I don't know how many people know what that is, but um, it's what kind of that? a it's a it's it's actually a, a form of uh, of brewer's yeast, uh, but uh, it, um, it, ha it it produces enzymes that continue to break down uh, sugars that most uh, most forms of Saccharomyces do not, mm. and so it, it has been an issue in the in the brewing industry. Uh, because uh, contamination with diastaticus can lead to um, over fermentation, in uh, particularly in the bottle, uh, in some cases. And so they, there's actually been a, a lawsuit over this. And um, but it it is in some strains of of yeast that's available to homebrewers, and it does really cool things like dry out your beer if you want that. So yeah, like, we're talking. Um, it's uh, so great. I think Mitch is coming up uh, soon. Mitch Steele is coming up and he's talking about an enzyme you can add to make. Um, he's, he was making brute IPAs, for example, right. a very interesting, sim similar concept, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so Thursday also kicks off the uh, national homebrew uh, judging or first, I should say, final round judging for the national homebrew competition. I was wondering if you could walk us through that and how that whole thing comes together. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is one of the first things the American Homebrewers Association ever did was uh, in 1979, we launched the, the National Homebrew Competition. Uh, I think we had like 38 entries in that first year. This year, we set a new record. Uh, we had over 9,100 entries judged in the first round, Wow, <laughs> uh, which makes it the world's largest beer competition. Uh, so that's that's cool to know that the, the largest beer competition is uh, is a homebrew competition. Um, so how we do it is we have, uh, we do it in a, a first round, uh, in the spring, uh, March and April, uh, at 13 different judge centers all across the United States. Uh, we judge in 34 different categories and then each of the top three entries in those 34 categories from those 13 judge centers advance on to the final round. Uh, so this year we have over 1200 entries that will be judged on, uh, June 27th, all in one day mostly in, you know, in three sessions. Um, 
So, so that's all, uh, all day Thursday, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, we'll we'll wrap up fairly early in the afternoon. We've got an extremely efficient process for for getting the judging done. One of the beautiful things about having this in c- conjunction with Homebrew Con is that we've got um, many of the top ranked uh, judges from the Beer Judge Certification Program that attend Homebrew Con and they're there to to do the judging as well. So um, you know some of the top judges in the world are going to be there to, to help us get those 1200 entries judged. Uh, and then we do the, uh, announce the awards on, uh, on Saturday, June 29th. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then I, I should mention in, in addition, I think you give out gold, silver, and, uh, uh, bronze in each category. Right. And then I think there's some overall awards as well, right? That's, that's right. So, so we do the, each category, we give away, uh, uh gold, silver, and bronze medals for the, for the, final round winners uh and then all the all the gold medal recipes uh go into a best of show and that is uh, the, the winner of the best of show is uh the home brewer of the year uh, we do the same for our mead categories and cider categories um and then we also have our ninkazi award which uh is named after the sumerian goddess of beer uh, and that goes to the winningest brewer in the competition uh, and then we have uh, a couple of club awards uh, that uh, that we we honor the the clubs that are participating in the competition with. Uh, so there's the Club of the Year award, uh, which goes to the winningest club. But we also have our Gambrinus Club award, which uh, takes the it's it's the winningest club per the number of entries they or per per the number of entries they submit. So, so by percentage, if you will. Right, right. So it's uh, and and that way, uh, smaller clubs. It's not just the largest clubs that are that are able to win that award. Nice. Um, so that's on Saturday, and then uh, of course during all three days, you mentioned you have the exhibition floor going on, and I think you told me seventy vendors out there, right? That's that's right. We have over seventy uh, seventy exhibitors. Uh, they they run the gamut. We got homebrew supply shops. Uh, then we got suppliers. Uh, like you know, you're usually an exhibitor there, uh, and um, yeah, I'll be on the floor uh, like, most of the time at the Beersmith mm-hmm. booth. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And like companies like Blickman and uh, uh, um, more beer and more beer, Spike, um, SS Brewtech, all of those, and then all the all the supplier side. You got Hobbs, Malt, Yeast companies, um, and then you know, a lot of uh, uh, even local homebrew supply shops. Uh, and then we have some some breweries that are also are in that expo hall, so you can have uh, have craft beer as well as uh, in that area. We have our um, our social club. Yeah, in case you get uh, thirsty, right? Right. Uh, you know, there we we don't we don't start serving until eleven. Uh, so you got to wait through until 11 o'clock before we will start serving, uh, serving anything, but we have uh, homebrew clubs that take turns, uh, serving their homebrew in the, in the social club. So as you're perusing the latest wares in homebrew, you can be sipping on some, some homebrew. Yep. It's usually very good actually. Have a yeah, great time. Yeah. Um, and that, oh, we also have uh, some of our sponsors do do demonstrations, so you can see some of the products that are available in the expo uh, being demonstrated by the by the makers. Awesome. And then uh, Thursday night is the kickoff party, uh, which I think is mainly craft beer, right? That's right. Yeah. So we've got uh, uh, we have over I think about forty breweries that are lined up for for the kickoff party this year. Oh, that's a that's um, a good number. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's a nice mix. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole most of those breweries are are, are very small local breweries um, that you're not gonna. I mean, there's no other way that that our attendees would be able to get to all those breweries. Uh, so having them all come to us is is pretty awesome. Uh, but we also have some of the uh, some some of the up and or the you know some of the the local favorites in uh, in New England. Uh, Night shift is uh, is going to be there. Uh, we just. Uh, got Lawson's finest liquids. Uh, they do the sip of sunshine, one of the top ranked beers in the in the country. Um, Main Beer Company is going to be there. Um, nice. Like I said, Moonlight Meadery, and we've got a, we've got a few other meaderies and cideries. Um, there's also uh, we we have uh, some of our brewery sponsors from that are more national in scope are going to be there. Sam Adams is is going to be going big this year, being in New England. Um, they're also doing some pre conference events. Uh, Sierra Nevada is going to be there. Bells. Melvin, uh, New Holland. Uh, so it's really a pretty awesome lineup. So you got a, yeah, you got a good mix there of, uh, small craft breweries, but also some of the regional ones as well. Yeah. And one of the 
beautiful things about this is obviously it's taking part at, at homebrew con. So all the attendees of this beer festival are homebrewers. And so they know a lot about, uh, obviously know a lot about beer and it's a great opportunity to be asking, you know, good, you know, questions of the, of the brewery staff, um, uh, Sam Calgioni from Dogfish Head once told me that it's the it's the highest beer IQ uh, beer festival he's ever been to. So, <laughs> and I totally agree. It's like that's that's exactly what it is. We are beer geeks. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then, uh, you know, more seminars on Friday and the the whole thing continues into uh, Friday night, of course, which is club night. Uh, certainly my favorite. Um, can you take a shot at describing club night? Club night? It's, it, it may be hard for people to understand if they're new. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it is hard to describe. Uh, it is the most fun <laughs> event in homebrewing. Like yeah. I, I, very confident in saying that uh, we have over 40 Humber clubs lined up. Uh, they're going to be, they, they set up their own booths. Uh, usually get very creative and tend to be themed around whatever their, their club name is, or their part of the country they're from. Uh, and then they're going to be serving the most creative, the most eclectic selection of beers that you're going to find anywhere. I think it's a, a, a typically each of them have a dozen or more beers too. So you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of beers to choose from. Right. And, and the creativity, I mean, obviously we're talking about homebrew, so they're, they're able to do anything and everything. And I've had just about anything and everything well beyond what I could possibly imagine could be done with beer. Um, as well as we have mead and cider. Um, it is, it is just a, a ton of fun. And then being able to interact with the, with the brewers and like tell, try something that's really extraordinary. That's been handmade, uh, and find out how the, how the brewer did it. And then of course, uh, a number of them dress up and act out as well. That's yeah, that's right. The, you know, they, they get a really get into the club theme and it, it just makes it so much fun. Um, I think yeah, my, my, my favorite story is from a couple of years ago. I think it was Seattle or Portland. We had, um, a group that was dressed as monks. Which was uh, mm-hmm. which is really cool. They're doing Belgian beers and everything, but they had actually taken the time to shave their heads, and um, they actually had the you know like a round hole in the top of their head, and then the the bowl cut all the way around. It was it was pretty amazing to see. Yeah, that that goes to show the dedication that people put into this event. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> they have like you know a dozen people actually shave their heads like that, and uh, pretty hardcore. Yeah. yeah, I'd have to do the opposite. I'd have to grow out some hair. Yeah. Well, um, so Friday night, uh, goes into Saturday morning, uh, where, where most of us are somewhat hung over, but, uh, <laughs> but the show continues, uh, through Saturday morning into Saturday afternoon. And then of course we finish up with the national homebrew awards. Uh, you already talked quite a bit about it, but maybe just talk a little about the award ceremony itself. Yeah. Yeah. So the, you know, the award ceremony, we, we announced not only the, the, um, uh, the National Homebrew Competition Awards. We have a few other awards that we do. We do um, uh, Homebrew Shop of the Year Award, which is fairly new. We just started that last year. Uh, so it's a way of honoring uh, the the businesses that supply our supply our hobby. Uh, and so it's uh, you know we we get submissions from members of the American Homebrewers Association for that. Uh, and then we also do our um, uh, Radagast Club of the Year Award. Uh, which is highlighting some of the uh, some of the things that the clubs do beyond the competition uh, to to uh, support the the hobby as well as their local communities. So really cool awards that we give out before we get into into the NHC awards. Um, but then then we uh, get into uh, announcing the best of the best. And when you're talking about the, like the world's largest beer competition, winning best of show out of nine thousand plus entries, um, there is there's nothing else like that. I mean, it, you have to make the most extraordinary beer, like well beyond my capabilities. I mean, I've been brewing for a long time, but I can't, I, I'm, I'm not anywhere near the level of the, the folks that are winning medals at this, yeah, this competition. My, my list of personal awards is pretty short as well. So, yeah. So, but I mean, getting to see those, see, see who those people are, uh, and then, um, you know, follow that, uh, we, we, we do our, our knockout party. So you get to meet all the, the award winners at the, at the party, talk to them, find out how they did what they did. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty great way to, to end the conference. And, uh, where can people learn more about HomebrewCon? Um, I'll bring up the website here if you want to talk about it. 
Yeah, sure. So uh, there's homebrewcon.org is the website for the conference. Uh, you can also find find that uh, from our uh, DHA website, homebrewersassociation.org. Uh, but yeah, homebrewcon.org. Uh, check it out. Check out the, the, the lineup of speakers uh, and the participating breweries, participating clubs. Uh, it's all there. Awesome. Uh, well, well, I'm looking so, forward yeah, to it. I'll be there for sure. Uh, yeah, I should point looking... out we have travel information up there too. So if you're, you know, we've got discounted hotel rooms, although you do do need to book soon in order to get to, to take advantage of those uh, those discounts. Nice. Um, well, I want to switch gears for a few minutes and actually talk about the AHA, uh, maybe a little bit about the state of home brewing. Um, Let's start with the AHA. How are things doing uh, for the American Homebrewers Association? It, it looks like you're continuing to grow, albeit slowly at this point, right? Yeah, yeah, things are things are great. Uh, we actually had we're up last year, uh, so we're we've been between forty five and forty six thousand members for for a couple of years, uh, but you know doing as as well as we've ever done, uh, coming off of you know, a, a history where we, we were never anywhere close to this level of membership. So it's, uh, it's great to see the organization strong. Um, we've been very active on, uh, on the legislative front. So we've been working, uh, in, with homebrewers in, in several States on, uh, on homebrewing rights, uh, bills. Uh, we just had a, uh, had a new bill passed in, uh, in Arkansas this past mm -hmm. year and we're working on some legislation uh that's kind of pro homebrew shop legislation in new york state oh nice and uh what what, what would that do what does that do uh that, that's uh aimed at uh allowing uh homebrew supply shops to uh sell um sell beer for retail so uh like they would be able to sell growlers of uh of local brewery beer, uh, and, uh, as well as like six packs and things like that. Currently only grocery stores and liquor stores can, can sell, uh, um, off for off premises consumption. Mm. Uh, so this would, be, this would, uh, allow homebrew shops to, to add to their, their mix of products, uh, and certainly aligns well with their clientele. So, uh, it would be a good, you know, definitely a good step for, for those shops to, to get this bill passed. And I know one of the perennial problems we have is uh, the mixing of homebrew and non-homebrew beer, or you know, separation at various locations and so on. Right? I know a lot of yeah. a lot of the clubs here can't meet at uh, at the breweries anymore, for example. Yeah, that's that is quite typical, actually. Um, you know, it's it's usually part of the alcohol code that doesn't actually uh, um, uh, fit into what you know the 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 laws for homebrewing. Uh, unless those homebrew laws specifically allow for uh, for homebrew to be brought onto licensed premises, uh, that that can be a that can be an issue. Um, yeah, it's the alcohol codes are are complicated, and so a lot of things that, that homebrewers do and and get used to doing are are happening maybe not legally, uh, but you know since since homebrewing is is operating a, on a on a fairly low level or has in the past, uh, you know a lot of the activities that homebrewers kind of took for granted uh, turn out to be illegal. Yeah. Uh, so when those things arise, like we're the, you know thankfully the American Homebrewers Association is there to to assist with getting laws changed. So that's that's you know one of the one of the critical reasons why you know I'm obviously very thankful for the forty five thousand members we have because that's. You know, those, that membership is what allows us to do those kinds of activities. Um, one of the things I did also want to talk about is the state of the industry. I know we had a, a, a pretty pretty steady decline from, I don't know, roughly 2014. Uh, but you were mentioning to me when we were talking offline that uh, things have started to turn around a little bit. Yeah, we do an annual survey of homebrew supply retailers. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, we've seen some, some you know, continuing single-digit declines in terms of sales at retail. Uh, but uh, this past year, we were overall up 1%. Um, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a mixed bag for, for 2018. Uh, we did see a, a number of shops uh, close, but we actually saw the fewest closings uh, in, in at least five or six years. So that, that's good. And seeing the, the 1% overall growth, uh, was, was the first time we've seen growth, uh, I think in, since like, like you said, around 2014. Um, so it's, it's good to see the, the, um, things, things stabilizing for, for shops. Um, you know, I think it's been particularly hard for, for the brick and mortar stores, 
Um, yeah, the, I think actually, the sales are skewed towards online as they are with, you know, Amazon and, and a lot of the other big, uh, big suppliers, right? The trend is to buy online now. Yeah, I think that that, that has been a growing trend. Uh, but, you know, in our surveys, we do we do find that the majority of homebrewers prefer to shop at a local homebrew supply, supply shop. Uh, and I think it is. But it's also really uh, important to remember that, you know, those those dollars you spend at that local homebrew supply shop mean that that's that store might uh, stay in business and, and be around and be a resource for the local homebrewers. Uh, so something to definitely not take for granted. Um, because the you know a lot of those stores are are struggling right now. So even if it costs a little bit more, I think it's worthwhile. I I like to support my local homebrew shops, um, and and because I want them to be around. I want them to be able to introduce new homebrewers to the hobby. Yeah, I was talking with a brew shop owner the other day, and he was saying that uh, they're also seeing an influx of craft breweries coming in, uh, people coming in to buy you know small quantities, but things to round out their the recipes perhaps it was kind of interesting yeah and not surprising to me uh you know on the on the professional side of things we've uh you know we've seen uh there's there's now over seven thousand breweries in this country um mm -hmm. i think that the median production is like 450 barrels per year wow uh, so tiny yeah. tiny so you know that's I, a nano that's a, a nano brewery right 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 and so uh so many of these breweries are are you know probably operating a tasting room on the weekend yeah. um and and so they you know it makes sense that you know they're going to be and they're, they're probably not going to have a, a uh, just a set lineup of beers. They're going to be tr trying new things and uh, getting getting ingredients on the spot market is tough. And uh, and on uh, that scale, it's going to make sense to to work with a local homebrew shop. So that's in in that way. Um, and and actually, that's something that our, our survey indicated. We asked like, does mm -hmm. do the local breweries in your area? Uh, help or 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 hinder your business, and we we're seeing uh, a greater uh, uh, number of shops that are indicating that those those breweries are actually uh, benefiting their businesses. And um, there's also a trend towards more all grain, right? Uh, something that's been going on for several years. Where are we with that? Uh... Yeah, uh, when back in the day when we first started the the, the survey, it was just definitely shops selling. Uh, you know, vast majority of their their beer supplies included extract. Uh, this year, I believe it was down to forty percent of uh, of beer ingredient sales included extract. Yeah, I think uh, it was so two or three years ago that it finally crossed that fifty percent mark, right? Right, right. Uh, and you know, that's I I think that's that's good. Uh, and that uh, you know, homebrewers are are I think it's much easier to get into all grain brewing than it used to be. There's there's equipment line you know specifically. Uh, addressing that you know back when i got started you know in in the early 90s um there wasn't a brew in a bag method and uh in fact i didn't know anybody who was who was brewing all grain everybody was brewing with extracts back then um so to to now have the you know that ability to do uh, re really pretty easily do all grain is is great it gives gives homebrewers a lot of flexibility um, my one fear with that is that it's it's a much longer process and takes a lot more knowledge. It's it's a lot harder to to start that way with mm -hmm. uh, with with all grain. So I still recommend for for beginning homebrewers, even if they fully intend to to brew all grain, to to brew a couple of extract batches just to to work out the kinks and and get to know the brewing process beyond the the mashing process to to get started. And I think uh, you mentioned that you believe that. Um... The, the nature of the home brewer may be changing a little bit. We're seeing maybe a little bit different profile for the average home brewer too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in the early part of this decade, we were seeing uh, huge growth in home brewing. Uh, yeah. It was like 20% a year, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, I think, I think we topped out at like 25 or 26% uh, in, in one year. Um, but yeah, back from, uh, you know, we started seeing really, really strong growth starting around 2006 and then really ramping up 2008 or 2000, 2008 to like 2012 were probably our, our biggest years in terms of growth. Um, and back then, you know, it, it, people were diving in and it became like a lifestyle thing where, you know, you, you, you went to work and then, but all the time you're just thinking about, about brewing. And, um, I think that's kind of like you, right? It, well, that is like me. Uh, but you know, <laughs> Not all of us get to get to you know have this be our our uh, full time our, job, yeah. our, our full time job. Um, 
And uh, these days, I think, you know, uh, there are probably fewer people that are really making it into a, a, a lifestyle. Uh, it's, it's, it's more of something that, that they do one, one hobby amongst many that they do an activity that they do. Um, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it makes it more accessible to a wider audience. Uh, but that, you know, the today's homebrewers, um, are, are probably not, well, I mean, I think a couple of factors that are, that are factoring into what we see at the, at the retail level, uh, isn't necessarily indicative of the number of people who are into, into homebrewing, but if it's, if it's, a, a an activity that you participate in a few times a year versus something you're doing every other weekend, um, that's going to impact the, the sales at, at retail, uh, as well as we've seen a, a shift, uh, in the volume of beer that's being present, uh, produced. So there's a lot of, uh, kits aimed at, uh, you know, one gallon to, to three gallon, uh, um, size versus what previously was traditionally, everybody was doing five gallons, maybe doing 10 gallons, but, um, that takes five me a little while. size was, was kind of standard for a long time. It takes a little while to drink 10 gallons though. For most of us, I don't know. For most of us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you think this is contributing to some of the decline we've seen the last couple of years then the, 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 the changing nature, I guess, of the home brewer? Yeah, I think, I think for sure that's, that's had an impact. So, I mean, one of the reasons why I think, you know, the AHA has been able to, to, to grow and, 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 and maintain a steady membership. Uh, whereas the, the retailers have been seeing some decline. Uh, I, th I think we're continuing to see, uh, you know, as, as we're not seeing any drop off in the number of homebrewers, uh, but the homebrewing behavior has changed. And mm -hmm. so that shift to to smaller, smaller batch size and less frequent brewing is is definitely going to impact the retailers, even if even if there are as many, if not more people in in homebrewing. Um, I think it's also you know, we've we've seen in 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 the past that the economy has an impact on the hobby. Uh, in times of, uh, of full employment, we tend to see fewer people doing, you know, doing other activities. They have less time uh, to devote to hobbies. Uh, so that's that's not entirely surprising to see with, you know, with the uh, unemployment rate grow, getting lower, that we're seeing a little bit more uh, 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 more struggle at the at the homebrew shop level. So people are either working more or perhaps uh, switching to hobbies that might cost a little bit more. I don't know. Uh, yeah, we're, we're they're they're uh, giving up on the hobby. I think part of it is that uh, there there's so much so many breweries out there. Uh, you know, think about you know having seven thousand breweries. Uh, you know, ten years ago, I think what there we were maybe just breaking two thousand. So that rapid growth in in breweries and the fact that that homebrewers tend to be the biggest supporters of those breweries. Uh, and the people who opened those breweries were probably the best customer of the, the local homebrew supply shop. <laughs> uh, the, the, those are going to have an impact. And, and so I, I think that we, for, for homebrewers, uh, they might not, they might not necessarily be getting out of the hobby, but if they're, if they're going to a, a local brewery a couple of times a week, um, that's less homebrew that they're going to be consuming. And so maybe they cut back on the frequency or the volume that they're brewing. So you could there again have have as many if not more homebrewers, but at the retail level, it's going to be more of a struggle. So what are some of the things the AHA is doing to uh, continue to promote the hobby? Um, so we do we do several things. Obviously, we got our our website homebrewersassociation.org. We've got a ton of resources for for people getting started into into homebrewing. Um, we also work with the uh, our our marketing team works with a PR agency. So we we put out. Uh, messages about homebrewing to try and get uh, media coverage for for the hobby, and that's a great way to introduce new people to to homebrewing. Um, I've mentioned some of the the legislative activities that we have, and that's that's an ongoing thing that we that we focus on. Um, so it's it's uh, you know a multi prong approach. You know, education, providing uh, resources for for people getting into the hobby, as well as you know continue obviously continuing with the hobby. Um, we have a ton of resources for, for our members. So, you know, we were talking about HomebrewCon. Well, all those sessions, we record them and then we, we make them available as members only content on homebrewsassociation.org. Um, we publish Dimergy Magazine, 
uh, so a lot of a lot on the education side. But then, you know, as I said, uh, we we support the retailers, we support uh, uh, legislative uh, efforts, Home, uh, homebrew and, clubs, right? Home, clubs. Homebrew clubs. That's right. We've got a, um, a program dedicated to to homebrew clubs. Uh, we we provide a, a very affordable insurance option uh, for homebrew clubs. It's it's not a it's not actually anything that we make any re, uh, revenue off of, but it is something that we put together because there were no affordable options for homebrew clubs. So um, that's a that's a great thing that the AHA can provide to uh, to support homebrew clubs. And what can we do as brewers to help uh, continue to grow the hobby? Um, well, you know, so certainly uh, introducing your friends and family to to homebrewing. Um, like I said, I I think you know. Teaching people the easy way is a, is a good way to go. Just get, get people started with an extract batch and, and let them know how just how easy it can be, uh, and then the, from there the the sky's the limit. Um, you know, if you know, I'd certainly highly recommend supporting local homebrew shops. Um, even if you end up spending a little bit more, uh, you know, it, it would be sad to see see those the stores go away. Uh, because they provide such a such an important service to uh, to to our community, um, and then you know be be brewing often. Yep, that, that's <laughs> brew more. Brew it's, more. You know, it's 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 fun to brew, and uh, you know if you can find the time, find ways to find the time. Um, you know, I think that's that's you know simplify your process. We just put out uh, the the brewers publications just put out uh, simple home brewing by uh, Denny Khan and Drew Beecham, uh, which. Uh, which I read and I, I love it because there's, there's so many things that, you know, you know even I have as a, you know, long time brewer looked at it like, I, there's so many things that I'm doing that I, I, I don't need to be doing. Uh, I've just been just, that's the way I had been doing it. And so, um, things that you can do to actually streamline your process and, and take less time to, to make a batch of beer. Awesome. Well, Gary, um, I just want to get your closing thoughts on HomebrewCon or the HIA or the homebrewing industry. Anywhere you want to go with that? Yeah, well, I'm uh, I'm super excited to to be in Providence the, this uh, this June. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all the all the the, the members who are going to be in attendance. Um, you know, and in terms of of brewing, like you know, honestly, it's never been a better time to be a homebrewer. Uh, you know, the the access to ingredients that we have, the access to information, uh, the equipment that's available uh, is is really astounding compared to what what homebrewing used to be. So, um, you know, remember that. And uh, and and when you're introducing your friends, like let them know just what the what, what is what you can do with with homebrewing. Well, Gary, uh, thank you again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate being here. And again, my guest today was Mr. Gary Glass. He is director of the American Homebrewers Association, uh, the national organization representing all American homebrewers. Thanks again, Gary. Yeah, thank you. Well, a big thank you to Gary Glass for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're currently offering 20% off the all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also Blickman Engineering, creators of the Riptide Pump. Designed for home brewers, this pump features a whisper quiet sealed housing, a removable tri-clamp stainless steel head that's easy to clean, and a built-in relief valve for easy priming. Get the Riptide Pump today. Another great innovation from blickmanengineering.com. And finally, Beersmith 3 is available now for download for both desktop and mobile platforms. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider support, new Whirlpool hop options, support for high-altitude beer brewing, and a whole lot more. Check out Beersmith 3 and get your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. (music) 